Mr. Kimball, would you uh, call the roll, please? Certainly. Uh, Mr. Ankuma? Aye. Mr. Castillo? Here. Ms. Carney? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Here. Mr. Sharp? Here. Ms. Ward is absent. And Mr. Webb? Here. Great, thank you. Okay, the first item on our agenda will be a city CFO finance update. And so we will now go down and uh, sit here at the table and uh, go through the update on the financials. Tuesday to you all. Um, what you have before you is a, a slide presentation that I'll go through first that was presented to the City Council last night. Um, it's the FY15 year end report and it's also a report on financial condition. Um, what I will cover in the year end finance report is where we are now in terms of our revenues and expenditures. Here we are as of the FY15 year end in terms of our fund balance, um, impacts of the financial report for FY15 on FY16 projections, and then we'll do a summary and a planning takeaways. And I don't mean that literally. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. Just to make sure everybody's clear, you know, paying attention. <laughs> right, just to see if you're paying attention. Yeah. We're listening. Okay, so the first slide is a graphic presentation of the results of operations. Um, the blue line is the operating revenue. Oh, yes, yes. Your um, expenses are broken down by general government, school division, and debt service. And those numbers go back to 2006. Um, what you will note is Beginning in 2010 up until 2014, mm -hmm. the blue line was way above the expenditure line. Um, that was partly planned um, financial planning where we built up the fund balance. It's, it was also um, projections based on assessed value, which we have corrected because now the timing of the assessments is in tune with our fiscal year, which eliminates large variations. For those that like numbers instead of graphs, the results of operations are presented in the next slide. It's a budget to actual. Um, what you'll note here, um, particularly with the local taxes, uh, are that they were below budget. However, year over year, which you'll see in the more detailed monthly report that you also have in your packet, uh, year over year, our growth was about 4.7%. Uh, on the expenditure side, um, if you include encumbrances, the variation for the general government is 1.9. The school division numbers are just based on the transfer, which means we transferred all the money that was budgeted to you. 
if you care to share what your results of operations oh, were, sure. I'm all ears. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you the annual score. You'll send me the annual <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, the next slide is the general fund balance as of uh, June 30th, and it's a breakdown um, of how the fund balance is broken up. It's a total fund balance of 31 million. The most important one to me and to uh, the general government is the unassigned, which is the red. Um, that's 18.5% of your FY15 expenditures or 17.6% of FY16 budgeted expenditures. Policy is, and there is a chart to show you that. Is that coming later? Yes, it is. The floor is 12% of expenditures, the ceiling is 17. Thank you. Um, also important in this graph is the $9.3 million, which is money that's committed for capital from the water proceeds. We also have $611,000 for building fee reserves and that's to pay for future inspections uh, of our um, new development projects. Now, I mean, you have your encumbrances um, in the dark blue, that's the 1.1 million. We have restricted grants. Um, we have two and a half million dollars that's committed to the FY16 budget. We have 1.6 that's committed um, for capital, and that's from our capital reserves um, that were created from the sale of property. Next slide is a graph for the unassigned fund balance. And as was noted, we are above 17%. <laughs> 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 oh, for you? Yes. Oh, that was special. <laughs> <laughs> Next to all of us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -oh. Those are key revenue terms. Oh boy. We have the edited version that you saw uh, the, today. The redacted. Oh, that was more. Oh. I didn't send it. Okay. <laughs> He's in the audience. Okay. Wow. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, well, the detail report we can go over, and that'll shed some light on things, and I'll tell you what the trends, how they relate to what you're missing. Although you have it, right? Oh, you got blank pages too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so you don't have a results of operation page. Next one is slide eight. Yeah, we don't have six or seven. And that's key, all right. And, and that's pretty relevant to this conversation. <laughs> okay. the, the results of operations was a, a, a line graph that just showed what has happened in terms of uh, deficits and surpluses since uh, FY 2006. And all it would show you is the big dip when we had the recession, um, large surpluses when we were recovering and how it's flattened out in the last two years. That's in essence what it is. All right, key revenue trends. Uh, your personal property tax, um, as you can see going back to 2011, our actuals exceeded our budget um, for quite a number of years. Um, we have uh, worked on uh, refining our projections so that uh, we are at or close to what we budgeted. When you look at that, this graph and that blue line for FY16, it means that we need to grow 6.6% to meet our revenue target for FY16. Next slide is sales tax revenue, and again, it's the same um, sort of trend. Uh, we've narrowed the gap, so our projections are a little more refined. Um, we need 3.7% growth in FY16 to meet our target. Meals tax, same thing, it's flattened out. We need 3.3% to meet our revenue target in FY16. Um, BPO, we're still playing catch up with. Um, so our, while we projected a, a growth for FY16, it's quite a bit under what we actually did in 15. So we're looking at that as 
um, one of the items that will help in our future forecast since we know it's still growing at a pretty good rate. What do you Another blank one, we, we fooled no you again. Yeah. No beep hole. Because we have no beep hole. <laughs> you got a hole in beep hole. Right. Um, on the other hand, other taxes. Other taxes, uh, we've uh, <laughs> exceeded our budget. We budgeted less in FY16 because we noted a, a big drop off in recordation taxes. Mm -hmm. However, in FY15, when we got the final results in, we knew that we had the drop in recordation taxes, but we had uh, an increase in our trans, uh, transient occupancy tax. So that sort of offset it, it exceeded it. Uh, we had good amusement uh, taxes, vehicle rental taxes were up. So again, we'll make that adjustment as we forecast FY17, we'll take that into consideration. Now, do you have the next one? Yes. Okay, <laughs> FY15 actuals to the projections, all right. All right. Now, what this is, again, I, I showed you the graphs first so you can see how we've closed the gap. Um, this particular chart shows you what's needed to meet the uh, revenue projections in FY16 based on the FY15 actuals. Again, you have the 6.6 .6 for personal property, 3.7 for sales, 3.3 for meals. Beepo only has to grow 0.1, so that's wonderful. And other taxes we don't have to worry about. Next slide is expenditure trends, and this is for uh, general government. It's blank of MP. All right. Great. Um, Expand. Was it a. Oh, it's an actual blank. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you have the, uh, the next slide, which is another version of expenditure trends. The, the slide that I'm talking about now compares compensation to the other general government expenditures and our uh, personnel expenses are about 58% of our total expenditures. That, that's what that uh, slide shows. Um, the next slide shows the breakdown of the salaries and benefits. And that goes back to 2009. The 58% is a reflection just of the city? Yes. General government? Yes. Yes, it does not include any the next slide is um, a comparison of general government expenditure trends to the school transfer on um, 2011-12-13. Um, the general government had more expenditures than the school. Uh, 14, we were about even. 15 and 16, the school was growing a little faster. Okay, now you have a page that says key updates. Yes. Yay! This, uh, this yes. Page 16 does not reflect debt service. Is that right? Uh, yes, it does. It does. And so the debt service shows up uh, in the general government. In the general government side, uh, whether it's supporting a. Doesn't school matter what or, debt or it not. supports, right? Yes. Either I missed it, or I see information about all the local taxes and this year and where they're headed, but I don't see any information about real property tax. All right, real property, property taxes on slide four. No, I see it's listed there, mm -hmm. budget and actual for this year, but I don't see. The chart or yeah, graph for like it. Where it's headed for next year, what growth we need for next year. Well, we didn't put it in there because right now, whatever we budget for our real property taxes theoretically is going to be what the actual is. Mm -hmm. Okay, and again, um, the in the prior years, um, if you go back to slide three, where we showed you the gap, that gap was due to the um, 
projection of real property assessment growth, as well as others, but that was the big driver because that's 60% of our uh, budget. Okay, so um, starting in 2014, that's pretty much eliminated. So whatever we budget is going to be the, is going to be the actual. If you're asking what the growth trend was, um, be, for those years, we did not include it in our slide presentation when we present the projections at the Joint Council School Board meeting tentatively set for December. That information is easy. Council member did ask about that last time. Uh, I mean, I just, that's a, such a important question because it's such an important part of our revenue. And I would I'd like to know kind of what we thought the growth was going to be in this and what it actually was and what we projected forward. And, and what we, what for budgeting purposes, we projected as the growth. Right. Anticipated growth. Yeah, which sort of touches on, you know, our measures, the basic projections. In the local taxes, yes, that, that there are some projections of what we anticipate the growth would be. Um, for your going forward in the future, you'll see that when we have the joint meeting. Mm -hmm. In terms of real property, whatever the assessor tells us the assess value growth is going to be, that's what's going to be budgeted. There won't, it won't be like in prior years where we had that split year. So if we said we expected to grow 2% and do 5 you had the big surplus, it's gone. It won't happen No, anymore. no, I get that. Okay. I, I get that part. I'm just curious about that. That wasn't the case last year. What we thought was going to be this change, what we expect, even though we know it's just the assessor, like what we expected. Assessor say. He hasn't said anything for 17 yet. Right. Oh, That's for 16. Um, for 16. Well, I don't have that with me, so. I mean, I can tell you what was budgeted for 16, I think. Something yeah, north of 46.1. Hmm? Something north of 46.1. Yes. yes. I, I don't have that with me now. But we okay. can get it to you. Okay. Let me see. Okay. Key updates. Um, one of the keys was the um, actuarial report. Um, our pension fund results are the actual value of assets. Um, the funding ratio is up from 92 to 97 percent for basic, um, 87 to 93 for police. Our market value of assets is up from 102.5 to 108.9, um, from for basic 98.1 to 108.5 for police. Now, all of that means that. Um, it impacts the contribution rate for FY17. What we are anticipating is that the contribution rate will drop from 12.9 to 7.7 .7 for basic, which will impact your school employees that are in the city pension. And for police, it will drop from 29.5 to 23.4. Um, our projections are the pension Cost reduction will be six hundred thousand, not including school employees. This of uh, the values here reflect as of June thirtieth. Yes. And uh, when you have that completed, is it reflective of a uh, multi-year uh, type of percentage, or is it is it a snapshot? taking into account just that most recent year? No, it's, it's a, we do use so multi-year. Okay, 
capital reserves from the sale of land. Um, as I indicated before, it's $1.6 million. The plan uses are a million for big chimney and 643,000 for facilities maintenance, maintenance, which includes school facilities. Um, that money is usually divided 50-50. Okay. Um, water sale proceeds, it's $9.3 million. Um, plan uses in the CIP are 3.4 for parking and unallocated, it is close to 5.9. In terms of voluntary concessions for school capital costs, we've received the Northgate proffer. Um, that was 680000 We anticipate that we will get the Harris Teeter in the spring of FY16, which will be $2 million, and we'll get another one point five from Tinner Hill in the summer of FY17. And you all know what that is slated to do. Okay. All right. The outstanding tax supported debt is broken down here. The general government is 14 million, schools a little over 40 million. Um, we've broken down the school debt by facility, so you can see what that is. We you know that involves two bond issues for Mount Daniel, one from 2006 and one from 2013-14. Uh, right. In the future, um, what we're talking about and what we um, presented to council last night, um, there are items that we have to carry forward. There are encumbrances that will be carried forward and, and be reflected in the FY16 budget amendment. And we are also having discussions about um, carry forwards for other items. Um, they include the, we had surplus building permit fees. Um, there is going to be discussion as to whether that goes into that development services fund pay for future inspections or whether we allocate it someplace else. Um, set aside for FY15, FY15 funds for transportation projects. We know we have WMATA costs that may exceed the budget. We did not budget that much for WMATA and we, we ran a deficit in FY15. Um, there's also um, discussion about an environmental program coordinator and then there's the FCC TV issue. So those, those things will be considered at the uh, as we go forward with the budget amendment and carry forwards. With that, I'll answer any questions on this document. Again, I apologize for the pages being missing, but I didn't make up. Can you tell us about the WMATA cost? Okay, um, WMATA is, is the cost, is our share of subsidy payments for Metro. There is a pool uh, of money for all the participating jurisdictions. It's generated from gas taxes. It's held by um, NVTA, and as Humada bills us, it's paid out of that fund. If there isn't sufficient money in the fund, the general government has to off it up. Generally, historically, the first quarter of the new fiscal year is when there isn't enough money in the trust fund to pay the WMATA, make the WMATA subsidy payment. In the last two years, it's run more than just one quarter. It's run more than what we budgeted. There were two, it was the post office property and the Pilat, the Dot. Oh, the Dolnik. The Dolnik property, yes. Oh, that was just. Yeah, there was money left over from that that we put into the reserve. Yeah, I guess in my mind, I sold them. Yeah, we sold them, but we put the money in the capital reserve. We didn't okay. use the money. Okay. So this is city on that. Yes, it was. It was. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. 
Other questions? There's a chart that shows the number of housing units in different locations and different types of units. Uh, has the city updated the, the housing unit figure for single family homes on that chart? Can't answer that at this time. Last, the last figure that we saw on there was from 2013. So it was not updated for two years. Okay. They are working on that for us right now. <laughs> I've, reached, I've reached out. And it would, it would be very helpful if the um, data there included a, a, um, a, a recording, which I anticipate could be done because of building permits, uh, where houses are expanded by more than 50 percent. But there's no, there's, no, there's no new unit per se, but <laughs> the size of the unit that's being um, demolished and replaced is being expanded by 50% or more. Good question. Ms. Carney. Um, this isn't about that presentation. I thank you for Richard and look forward to receiving the full copy at some point. I, I share your pain and this problem before myself. Um, it's really it's, uh, the memo from Richard to the Mayor and City Council dated September 21. Mm -hmm where it looks like we had uh, about $1.7 million of general government expenditures that we didn't expend, and, you know, good. Um, but are any of those um, encumbered toward future projects? I know last year at the end of the year we had some money that wasn't expended, but we knew it was going to be spent in the next year on certain kinds of projects. Yes. What, what and that if you go back to slide four, you'll see that the, the two numbers differ, and they differ by about 971,000. Those were the encumbrances. And if you look at that report, um, on the financials themselves, um, You look at the encumbered column of the financial report, the uh, the expenditure page, that should be page two. Page two. And it's quite the same. Um, you'll see a, an encumbered column, and that's the 971,000. That's what's going to be encumbered, and that's the difference between what you have on the slide presentation and what you have on that cover sheet of the memo. We included the encumbrances in the actual expenses. Slide presentation. Okay. I see that there's a, there are a couple there that are kind of big, and uh, maybe you can just give me quick words about kind of for layman what that is, or get back to me one or the other. One is executive management fairs. All right, that, those are IT projects that we okay. were committed to and didn't get done in FY15. Perfect. That's, that's the major part of the carry forwards there. Yeah. Um, for public works, the 557 is road work. Road work. Any other questions on that? That touches in terms of the pension fund and FY2017 contribution. Mm -hmm. There was 600 for general government and each all part. I think it's about what that I think we're about like three hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year in expense currently. So so it could not be about a hundred thousand. Yeah, about a hundred Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I'm sorry. If you want to tackle it, I mean uh, <laughs> this this the financial report is um, more detailed than the slide presentation. So if you do want to go through that and brief, yep, we can. Take a deep breath and let's dive. For me, I'd rather have a chance to suggest it first. We're just for the first time. I reserve the right to return the questions. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> Anybody else want to? Uh, I'll, 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 I'll,
Joint meeting is coming up soon. Just load up the questions. I'll be uh, happy to address them. Thank you, sir. Uh, Just one, one last one. Um, speaking of joint, uh, is there a team as yet uh, that's been assembled to assess the um, financial for the GM MEH project? You'll have to ask the city manager and your superintendent that. We're working through that right now, Mr. Shark. We do have um, the financial firm Davenport, and then uh, we're working on an RFP for that right now. So there's a is. separate uh, consulting uh, group that's that's uh, being engaged for that. Yeah, you want to talk about that? We, uh, we've yeah. kind of laid it out this way. In terms of the financial consulting services that we would need for campus project, there's sort of three pieces to it. One would be the city's financial advisor for the debt. One would be our fiscal impact analysis for future development, what kind of revenues and costs will it generate just for the private development itself. And then the third is uh, commercial real estate advisory services. So structure, what's the value of the land, what, should, what are ways we can what should, we, what should we be getting, either under a lease agreement or a lease agreement? Those are sort of the three big areas of concern. The first two I listed uh, best served by using our current financial advisor, Davenport, and our current fiscal advisor, uh, Jason Weiss. And the third piece uh, we still need to bring on board. Is there a description of what? Uh deliverables might be and when they would be delivered? We've asked all these, the, we've asked Davenport and Tischler Bice to put together a scope of work and a schedule and a budget. And as part of the negotiations for the third piece, the commercial real estate advisory service, get that as part of their proposal. Uh, when may we see those descriptions? And, and the intended time of delivery? Well, we need to have them on board, obviously, in, in October to have them set up and ready to go for October 30th when the proposals come. Working on it now, and we'll do an initial staff review of it uh, with our team, and then we'll take it out to the city council. Well, the first two, we've been talking with them, so they're basically, they know what they, they know that this is coming, so they're working on exactly, you know, setting, clearing their schedules so that they can help us in November and December. Um, the real estate advisory services piece, we need to get that partner on the end, and then get that. So the, the deliver, it sounds like uh, things would be delivered in November and December. Is that right? There, there won't be any will, upfront. Their work will be conducted in the uh, evaluation in November and then working with their elected bodies in December. You all are the deciders on shortlisting the proposals for you receive. They would be 
part of the advice that you'll be getting for that. We would then keep them um, working for the cities to evaluate the phase two detailed proposals and then to advise us. Okay, I, I understand that we would need evaluation expertise um, as, as the proposals have come in, but are, are you saying that we are not anticipating doing any upfront uh, evaluation of either our, our existing capacity or what we anticipate to come in? Yeah, we would uh, we'd expect them to do a baseline analysis so that they're not evaluating the proposals cold. We want them to have thought about the problem before they get proposals. And um, not necessarily come to any conclusions before they get proposals, but having got their head wrapped around what it is we're trying to accomplish and kind of what the parameters are, what, we're, what they think the reality is that we're going to get from the proposals, then they will, you know, having acquainted themselves with the situation, they'll be better prepared to. So that piece of it would be ready before the proposals come in? Well, I think that work is not necessary. Um, we want them to go through that through an exercise before the proposals come in. Whether there's a deliverable before the proposals come in or not, I think we can discuss with them whether we actually need to deliver. Um, on one hand, it could be helpful to have the school board and the city council to have some parameters as to what value might be for the real estate transaction. However, that value is wholly dependent upon the density. So you really do need the proposals in hand before you really start to have a good grasp as to Well, um it seems to me that the experts would be able to anticipate, based on various levels of density, what the values should be. They can do that. And that's, that's what I think it would be helpful for us to be able to, to see that before the proposals come in. The steering committee, just so there's a lot of context on this. The steering committee actually was a, talked a lot about should we do a value study before we embark on the RFP? And the decision was made. That would be, on one hand, it could be a useful academic exercise, but on the other hand, it could get us anchored on values that are in fact not based on what the market can actually deliver or highest and best use. And so, the decision was not to do that. And now we're, um, I think the exercise to lay out some parameters really is, is would be to just get the team sort of moving together and understanding, preparing to, to evaluate. And rather than getting our, you know, getting a whole lot of anticipation as to, you know, what the, what, you know, one set of experts that think might happen. We just think that, I think the steering committee concluded that the RFP process is the best way to determine value rather than an academic exercise. I, I'm fine with the decision that was made earlier when there was perceived to be a substantial time lapse between you know, when this, when this mm -hmm. uh, uh, anticipated value uh, <laughs> reckoning would be done and when the proposals would actually come in, but now we're at a point where there's a very close proximity here of the when that reckoning is done and when they come in. But I, th I think it's I think it's important that we have that uh, so that we, we we have some idea of whether whether what's being proposed is is uh, at least what our experts tell us is is uh, on the mark or pretty far off the mark. Thoughts about that? I think, on the one hand, if we don't want an anchor for anchors, 
description of the way that we had thought was the best way to tackle the problem. Um, to have experts at our side to evaluate the value propositions that are brought to us in the proposal. And I think that advice can also be that if the development was changed in X or Y way, you could possibly have a different value, a better value. Um, that also would be I think other aspects of the advice would be using the lease structure versus the fee simple. Best ways to structure the lease. What to watch out for in a lease. All those things would be in the scope of work for the. Other questions. meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act and whereas section 2.2-3711B of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by the school board that such closed meeting that was that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law now therefore be resolved that the Falls Church School Falls Church Public School Board hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirement by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification applies, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Thank you, Mr. Ankuma. Thank you, Ms. Carney. Mr. Uh, Ankuma. Aye. Mr. Castillo. Aye. Ms. Carney. Yes. Mr. Lawrence. Yes. Mr. Sharp. Yes. Ms. Ward. Mr. Webb. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Now we all rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Now we move to adoption of the agenda. Do I have a motion to adopt the agenda? Thank you, Ms. Mr. Lawrence, Ms. Carney. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Abstentions? Seeing none, the agenda is adopted. Now we come to section five, public comments and requests. If you have a desire to comment, you have a three minutes under bylaw 2.30. Uh, additional written statements may be submitted to the clerk for dissemination to board members and for the record. Uh, I see I have two comment forums here, the first being that of uh, Allison Kuchma. Welcome, Ms. Kuchma. I came before you on September 8th and really pleaded with you to, to share with the community how much we have spent 
at Mount Daniel uh, to date so far and try to have some transparency on the process. Um, on September 9th, I went to the um, Thomas Jefferson, the ice cream social, the PTA meeting, and Dr. Jones spoke. And at that time, she said uh, she had an opportunity to talk to a room full of parents. She told that, said um, that it cost us nothing. Um, and, and so that was really alarming to me because I know that we have spent money to date. So I did a Freedom of Information Act request for uh, the information that I hope that you guys have on how much money we've spent to date and received that on the evening of the 18th. And interestingly, on the, on the afternoon of the 19th, we get a communications from the school district telling us how much money we've spent. And uh, it's interesting because I'm really uncomfortable with this communication based on the information that I have. And I just wonder if you've looked at this and you've compared it with the information you have or whether you approve this stuff. Um, you know, we talk about how in this statement that, that you need to spend money to prepare for the 2232. That's actually a true statement. Um, then they go on uh, to talk, you know, it costs a lot of money and this needs to happen. And then it's divulged that we've spent 1.2 million. And it kind of leaves the public to believe that the 1.2 million was spent to prepare construction schematics and designs for the 2232. But that, that amount of money is way over what we would need to do to prepare for 2232. And if you look at the information that I received in my Inf Freedom of Information Act request, um, to be ready for the 2232, you'd have to spend about 100, looks like $156,000. Um, the additional $900,000 is on blueprints for a renovation of building we may never build. And that's almost a million dollars and that's 20 teachers. Someone is just giving you some really bad advice, and I'm really troubled by it, and it continue to be troubled because the information that comes out just, you know, it's kind of insulting because we're an intelligent community, and so you allow this kind of thing that is misleading at best. This information is misleading at best. And I just want to know if you guys are talking about a plan B, and who is going to pay for this? This project does not move forward. Who's going to eat the million dollars in blueprints? Who's going to pay for this? Is Grunley going to say that we're going to pay for it? Is Arcadis going to pay for it because they're our construction manager and giving us this great advice? I mean, these are questions that the community wants to know. Thank you, Ms. Kutchman. All right, uh, next up we have a comment form from uh, Mr. David Kuchma. Welcome, Mr. Kuchma. Hi, thank you, Dave Kuchma, A13 Fulton Avenue. I, uh, in, in terms of the, the context of, of really what my wife just spoke to, I just wanted to um, express my uh, concern and a little disappointment with when the Mount Daniel referendum was sold to the community, that there was, I guess there was a statement that said that the community was, that the adjacent communities were on board with the project, and now we're in this situation that we're in because we're finding out that that really wasn't the case. And I. You know, it kind of speaks to, you know, the, you know, the communications with integrity and, and just, just a little disappointing that, you know, in light of the, you know, the NIMBY attitudes that we have, that this project was that perfect uh, storm, if you will, for that. So uh, that was just, you know, one thing that I wanted to say. Uh, I was curious, um, and, and maybe this could come out in the superintendent's report, or if one of you know, the, 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 I, want to, I believe it's the Weldon model that we use that we pay for that study to project population, and I was curious what that, what that cost is. Um, so if, if that could be uh, put out there to the community. Um, just another thing is, as, uh, as Mount Daniel kind of turns along, uh, we noticed that there was also a change order for an emergency generator that was needed, or for some reason there was a generator that staff requested. So um, maybe we could be enlightened as to what that was for, and. Um, potentially why it wasn't included in the cost of the big renovation that we're doing. Um, and uh, just an update on, a mini, uh, on and any other work that may be up and coming that will be in addition to the 1.3 million that we know that we've spent. And that might actually include what we've paid Arcadis so far, because um, that, that's out there. And, um, and then, um, uh, let's see, we got the, the generator. 
and and as to whether or not any subcontractors had been released on the project uh, i know that we were in the rush to go we had signed the design build contract we have the plans did we let foundations steal uh, so are there bills that are coming in from subcontractors and then also potentially delay claims do we anticipate that we would be in a position to where we would have now delay cost on top of that to contend with so if you could keep us posted with that we would appreciate that okay thank you mr kutchman mr kimball do we have any other comments uh we do sir uh one uh letter to the school board from um, Stephanie Oppenheimer. Uh, Ms. Oppenheimer writes uh, to the uh, school board with um, uh, concerns about school administrators uh, receiving Apple watches to wear. Thank you, Mr. Kim. Um, okay, now we come to item six on the agenda, the consent agenda. I'd seek unanimous consent to adopt the consent agenda. Okay, without objection, so ordered. Uh, now we come to item 7.01. Um, business action and information, and this concerns a complaint from the public. Uh, is Mr. Horn here? Yes, Mr. Horn. Uh, Mr. Horn, the agenda item there references policy 5.14. Is that... Is that the correct reference? Okay. Uh, it's it's uh, item 7.01. No, the Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, by way of uh, background, uh, on about September 4th, the school board received a complaint regarding uh, communications from Dr. Jones to the Special Ed Advisory Committee. One was a communication distributing a survey to the members, and the other was a message about scheduling of the committee's first meeting. And the complaint alleged that Dr. Jones's actions have um, harassed or intimidated the Special Ed Advisory Committee um, and that Dr. Jones should have not communicated directly to members of the speak uh, directly, but should have done so through the chair. Um, we have conducted an investigation of these allegations. We have consulted with the Virginia Department of Education about the pertinent regulations that were alleged to have been violated, and we have reviewed the applicable regulations. Um, and we find that uh, based on the communications themselves, as well as the regulations, that there has been no violation. Um, with that, I will throw this out to the members of the board, if they have any other thoughts or comments that they would like to express about this complaint Mr. Marks. I'll just make a quick comment I mean the basic idea was that the superintendent didn't have the right to communicate directly with members of a school advisory committee um, the special ed advisory committee I'm the liaison to it is it has some special rules by the state um, one of which says that they the committee specifically reports through the superintendent to the school board so the idea that excuse me mr lawrence could you just hold on for a second there there's some feedback or distortion in the mic is could we do something about that because it's it's very distracting test test is it okay now? hello i think that's better but but it, it seems to go with well no there it is again And earn your paycheck tonight. <laughs> is that that's much better, much better. Thank you. I'm I'm sorry, Mr. Lawrence, but I, I couldn't. It's okay. very hard to pay attention with that noise. So please, please proceed. Sorry, I would just say that uh, a major part of the complaint was the fact that 
the allegation was that the superintendent should not be allowed to communicate directly with members of an advisory committee, only the chair. For special ed, it's set up, well, first of all, I, I think that assertion is a bit absurd for a, a school superintendent, but um, the special ed advisory committee is set up differently in that the state specifically says it reports through the superintendent to the school board. So the idea that the committee, and it's the committee, not the chair, could report through the superintendent without the superintendent being able to communicate with each of them directly just flies in the face of, of common sense. So I think, you know, what we did here was, was good due diligence and uh, came up with not only the, the correct and legal solution, but also the, the common sense one. Thank you. Other thoughts or comments, Mr. Sharp? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I had a chance to review some of the background correspondence between the chair and the, uh, the state official, and I will just say uh, it read very much uh, like I recall <laughs> reading a law professor's analysis of uh, some fact pattern and, and whether it uh, fits within a particular uh, uh, legal requirement. Just uh, uh, taking the the uh, analysis from multiple angles and trying to determine was there any uh, basis for finding a violation. And uh, indeed, uh, as, as the uh, correspondence went back and forth, there, there simply were, was not a, a, a finding that, uh, that, that a violation occurred. Now, I will say in, in instances where the statute and the regulation are, are really silent, uh, I think as Mr. Uh, Lawrence was indicating, uh, the, it's, it's silent on some of the specifics here. Uh, I think there is uh, inherent uh, operational authority uh, that a school board has for, uh, for, for having the, uh, uh, the ability to say what its advisory committees should be doing and, and to, to provide for their efficient and, and smooth operation. And so uh, while those uh, things are not entirely explicit in the statute of the regulation, I think they are inherent in what the uh, relationship is between the, uh, the schools and, and its advisory groups. And so I, I, I especially want to thank uh, uh, the chair for being so thorough and, and careful here and I, I think uh, I think what uh, the result here is the appropriate result. Thank you. Other comments, Ms. Carney. There, now it's green. Um, one of my observations having observed both this complaint and the process we've been through to try to resolve it is even though we just updated our policy 5.12 which has to do with these advisory groups and boards, I think it may behoove us to go back and look again to be quite specific so there's no question about the role of these advisory boards and commissions uh, as far as our policy is concerned, the role of the leadership of these groups, um, because I, I, I kind of feel like the unsaid thing in this complaint was that there was a belief that this, this group was independent of the school board and that the chairman of it had broad powers which frankly the mayor of this city don't have. <laughs> I mean, you know, right? I mean, you don't have the powers that were alluded to. I didn't as chair, the mayor of the city doesn't have those powers. And so what that tells me is we've not been clear enough in our policy. And I would uh, encourage us to go back and be very explicit so we don't have these bits of confusion in the future. Thank you, Ms. Carney. Other comments? Right, I, I would just close by, by saying this complaint raises um, multiple issues and I think um, Ms. Carney touches on some of the considerations that go to governance, the role of boards, the role of advisory boards, the role of chairs of bodies. Uh, I would like to say that I have magic powers as chair of this body and in fact I don't. As Ms. Carney has noted from time to time, when she was chair she has one vote of seven, I have one vote of seven. I am not the boss of anybody. Individuals do not act on their own. We act as a body. When I'm out there on the street as chair of the school board, my opinion plus 350 will get you a tall skim latte. We have to vote. We have to choose as a body. And that's the same goes for advisory committees. While Ms. Carney would have us revisit our policies, and we will, 
Um, I think these were drafted with an eye to people of good faith acting in cooperation with each other. And you can't legislate against that. Um, I think the notion that a chair could prohibit the superintendent from communicating with anybody is frankly, uh, demonstrates a lack of transparency that I think is troubling. Um, I hope that we realize that we are a community and that communication should be encouraged. Of course, it should be civil. And I think in this case, all of the communications at issue were professional and civil. And, and I would uh, ask members of the community going forward to be cognizant of the roles of the various bodies to realize that cooperation and comedy is what generates results, not confrontation, acrimony, and uh, you know, results-oriented um, assertions of authority that are frankly not founded in statute regulation or anything else. Um, I will also note that we did invite the complainant to address us and the complainant declined. Um, we clarified with the complainant that we did not see any material issues of fact. In other words, the issues raised in this complaint, and I'm sorry if I sound like a boring lawyer, um, but, but there, there were no issues of fact. The issue was could the, could the superintendent make these communications or not? There was no dispute over what was said. Um, that was all very clear in the record. And so we decided on that basis. Um, unless there are any other comments, I will uh, seek a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that the board authorize the chair to issue a letter of finding as discussed by the board. Do I have a second? second. All right, Mr. Kimball, will you call the roll? Mr. Ankuma? Aye. Mr. Castillo? Aye. Ms. Carney? Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Sharp? Yes. Ms. Ward? Yes. Mr. Webb? Yes. Thank you. It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, now we come to item 7.02, approval of student trips. Uh, there has been some, I know we've discussed this before in, in our last meeting uh, about plans, Dr. Jones. Uh, so this, this is the next step in that, and so I'll hand it over to you. Um, yes, as you know, when we um, changed uh, Mr. Horn's role as Chief Officer for Legal and also Student Activities, uh, one, of, one aspect that we needed to get much better at was making sure that overnight trips are all coming to the school board. We need to know where our students are traveling and what's happening in the school division. So these are three trips uh, for your approval. The um, Model Nation is um, a trip where they actually travel down to William & Mary High School uh, for a conference, and it again is an overnight conference. The band trip that's in here uh, is the band generally goes somewhere every year. This is uh, back to Atlanta. And last year, I think they traveled in the fall because I heard somebody say today they were bummed they were going in the spring. I guess it falls in a really challenging time, but the kids love it. Um, and the trip, Ms. Carney did ask a good question because there is a statement uh, in here where it talks about... Um, Students are aware that these trips are not mandatory, nor is there any aspect of a grade involved, um, and that if they cannot afford the trip, they, are, they, they do not have to go. But uh, what I wanted to point out in here is that there are ample opportunities. The trip is $650, and as it has been in the past, and this is actually in the second paragraph, students will be provided numerous opportunities to raise funds for this trip, uh, which includes the music days, and that's when they go out and work for the community all over the place. And um, so if a student um, does not feel that they can afford the trip, they are given the opportunity to raise the funds. And I did point out and share with Ms. Carney last year, we did have at least two grants that were put forward to the foundation um, to fund two students on this trip. And the foundation, after careful review, did deny that grant because the students had chosen not to take any opportunities to earn money. And they just didn't feel like that was the right thing to do. Um, and then the last but least trip here is soccer. Um, and I'm trying to remember where they're going, Mr. Horn. Thank you. Um, so we are, um, we would appreciate your approval for these overnight trips for our kiddos. Okay, uh, any questions, Mr. Lawrence? Uh, just a couple questions. Um, these, these go into 2016 and they're only high school. And I know at least uh, being a middle school parent, I know of you know, some that my son will be doing. 
Others can come to us in the future. It just happens that these are all high school this time. Yes, and feel free to jump in, Mr. Warren, if you want to. But we are trying to make sure any any trip that is overnight that is school sponsored and association associated comes to the school board. Yeah, because if I have to come home tonight and say the TSA trip is not happening, I'm not going to be welcome to come home tonight. So that's correct. Um, the, we have beginning last year, we we made sure that those uh, uh, staff members who planned to take overnight trips knew that they would need to come before the board. Um, developed a short list um, of criteria that they would submit to us for vetting. One of them is their plan for including students who otherwise cannot afford it. Um, it is our desire not to bring you a trip that doesn't have an adequate plan for providing for scholarships or fundraising or some other methods to ensure that if we sponsor a trip that we are, are saying that any student who is otherwise qualified to go will be able to go without regard to their means to pay for it. So these three trips meet that. Uh, these three trips in terms of timing, um, the band trip is a very large trip with many kids so it needs to be approved so they can make some actual headway. Model United Nations is occurring in November so there's a time frame, uh, a time is of the essence there. Um, and the boys soccer trip is on the agenda for tonight because we received the invitation for that exclusive tournament just this week. Uh, and you don't have much of a window to accept that invitation as their tournament will fill up. Um, so that explains why these three are here tonight, but we anticipate bringing them as they come to us. Any other questions for Mr. Horn while he's on the spot, Mr. Horn? Oh, not, not a question, but just uh, pointing out, since I'm the liaison to the Falls Church Education Foundation, back in February, they had an issue as to whether or not they were going to fund student trips. In, in, in any capacity out of unrestricted funds, and they very specifically decided not to. So it's not just the, the one that Tony was talking about. They made a, a policy decision. Okay, Mr. Horn, just uh, one, one question. For clarification, games or tournaments that sports teams engage in regularly do not go through this process, correct? Um, Mandatory Virginia High School League uh, advancement travel will not come through this body each time because we wouldn't have time between knowing of the trip and following. Uh, the reason this is here is because it's an optional tournament. We're not required to participate in this soccer tournament, and it will require the loss of instructional time of one day. So it's a voluntary thing. It's something our, our soccer team would like to do, but it's no different than Model United Nations kids missing a day or band kids missing two. It, in our opinion, it would require your endorsement whereas the Virginia High School League postseason schedule is implicitly endorsed by your signature on the membership application. Just, just wanted to make that clear for the community. Uh, one other question, just so that you can clarify. I, I received a question, why was the trip to Chile canceled this year? Um, that's not my understanding, so maybe you could just clarify for the, uh, yeah, for the community. Our understanding in the spring of last year was that our staff at the high school needed a respite from the annual Chile exchange and that was one of the purposes of Mr. Burge traveling with that group last year was to work with the school administration there on a revised schedule. So it wasn't canceled because of a review in, in policy or, or change in program. It was, it was postponed as we reviewed the relationship with the sister school. Okay, just, just wanted to clarify that as well. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Horn before we release him? Okay. All right, then. Uh, would I have a motion, please? I can take it. I move that the board approve the mentioned overnight field trips in accordance with policy 6.38 student trips. Second. Thank you, Ms. Carney, Mr. Lawrence. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? And any abstentions? All right, thank you. The motion passes. Uh, now we are at 7.03, uh, approval of the work plan. Dr. Jones, you've been hard at work. How's it going? <laughs> I'm ready to get this up on the wall so I can start marking something off. Um, it, we, we did uh, make all of the changes based off of the notes. There were quite a few. Um, probably a couple of things I, will, I do want to point out um, would be on page two um, on 21st century teaching and learning. 
Mr. Sharp had given us um, a great priority to provide staff and community data on our students' academic performance. It did say only five years, but I did change that to three to five, so I just want to be clear about that because we are very careful to make sure, and we tell our administrators and our teachers understand we only compare apples to apples, and we have some assessments that we don't have five years of data without comparing to a totally different assessment, totally different standards um, in Virginia. So I just I wanted to note that that was in there. Um, and I think that was the only change that I actually made that um, as I was writing it, I thought I needed to make that clear. So if you do have any questions, um, you know, let me know. And again, we will be hard at work on this. Any questions? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Sharp. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank Dr. Jones for going uh, through this very carefully and appreciate the uh, uh, way that the request for these data points had has been uh, pulled into uh, a realistic uh, set of, of uh, requests here. I, th I think it's I think it's done very well. Thank you. I, th I think there was a bit of misunderstanding uh, in regard to the uh, I believe it's in 1.3. Um, it's the uh, it's the point. Where are we here? It's the point having to do with graduation. Okay, it's at the bottom of page three. And uh, I'll, I'll just ask, uh, is it intended here that um, the any student who is at risk of not graduating, that that student may be in any grade? And, and I, I understand that as they get closer, that that would be the the, the idea is that that uh, yes, certainly there would be a a strong focus on students who are in the senior uh, at at the senior class. But is, is there also uh, an intent here to identify students in earlier grades who may be at risk of not graduating on time? Right, absolutely. Is that true? Yeah, absolutely. And okay. we assess every freshman coming into the high school. Math and reading, we do benchmark screening. Any student who needs to be in, in intervention, not because they're in a subgroup that is, um, whether it's special education or ESOL, but if they just are a student who doesn't have the skill set, we work individually. Um, and the freshman through the senior year, we're making sure we do that every single year for students. Um, and we provide whatever resource or tool an individual needs to find success in our high school. And I do think that's why, you know, like this year, we had 100% of our students graduate. Tremendous amount of work um, to graduate every single student. And um, and I did add in here, Mr. Sharp, I'm glad you pointed this one out because I knew there was something else. Well, you see where it says with the exception of transition students? Right. And yes. I did want to put that in there. The school board talked about that. And sometimes we will have an on-time graduation rate that shows 98 or 99. But those transition students, they're on time really is 21 or 22 because they have special needs and need to stay with us, but they do ding you for that in your graduation on time rate. So I just wanted to put that in there that we expect those students to stay with us and that's what they should be doing. So, Yeah, I'll just mention there is some discussion going on at the federal level currently of uh, how these uh, standards will be uh, interpreted there going forward. Uh, that is the on time graduation and um, uh, of course, if, if there are indeed requirements that come out of that, we will have to observe them. But, but uh, l let me just suggest that there might be a, a, a slight change in phrasing here to, to clarify uh, the intent of, the, of this item. And uh, I think it may say, identify any student who is at risk of not graduating on time, and paren, with the exception of transition students, close paren, so that every student who enters GM and especially students who enter the senior year graduate uh, on time and uh, student success is bolstered. If that's um, you know, putting in a bit of an extra clause there, make sure we're covering other, other uh, students who are, uh, he, who are at GM just earlier than the senior level. Okay, I can make that adjustment, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. The last, last comment okay. I would have has to do with the um, last page. Well, the last narrative page, page seven. Uh, we discussed at some length 
the idea of having a zero-based budget process. And I'll just say, I think there, again, is some semantic and difficulties here. Uh, our, our mandates that are uh, ones that come largely to us from the state with SOLs, with uh, pensions, <laughs> with uh, uh, the contracts that we have with our, with our staff, uh, the procedure that we have to have for, for uh, reduction in force, if, if that ever becomes a necessity. Uh, there are quite a few things that really constrain us uh, from going to a really, z what, <laughs> what some people would term a zero-based budgeting system. And so I, I think it would be a misnomer for us to, to throw that term in there. I do think it, it, uh, it is a desire by the board, again, I'll just you know, offer my opinion on this, and, and I think by the public, that we do uh, look at our budget in a very careful way, that we uh, take a look at uh, particularly uh, large uh, expenditures and break them out into, into components so that we understand what each of the components involves uh, and, and uh, have a clear justification of what each of the components uh, will, will deliver for us. And uh, to that extent, I think, uh, getting, getting to that kind of detail is what I, what I think the board and the public is, is really getting after and not, not necessarily the, the precise term zero-based budgeting process. So if, if, um, if we might... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I don't have phrasing here tonight to, to get at that, and I know we didn't really discuss phrasing of it last time. Uh, if we can uh, uh, think about this and get to a, maybe a better description of it at the point where we're, where we're in our budget process, including budget process that we may enter pretty soon here with the, uh, uh, with the city council and with some of our stakeholders, uh, as, as long as we approach it uh, uh, in that careful manner, I, I'm happy to leave, leave these uh, uh, statements as they are for now, but I would like us to revisit uh, our, our budget approach as we, as we get into the budget process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Any other comments? All right. Uh, do I have a motion to approve these, uh, the work plan as... Amended ever so slightly. Mr. Chairman, I move that the school board approve the FY16, FY18 work plan as amended ever so slightly. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Second. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Uh, next item on our agenda, item 7.04, approval of the GMMEH proposal review team. Dr. Jones. Um, as you know, this is part of um, our planning process when the RFP comes in uh, that we have talked about with the uh, city council and school board that there needs to be a review team that is very small, and that's at the recommendation of our attorney, that actually, as we were talking about earlier tonight, is gathering all of that information for the school board from the advisors and then bringing that to the school board and city council. Um, and along kind of that thought, I will just point out that um, the school board calendar dates are down on the bottom under materials for board review. Mr. Shields and I worked again last week um, to continue to refine those because they have to work for school board and have to work for city council. They're tough. Um, but the goal is for us to have this very small review team working with um, our attorney and then, of course, all of those advisors bringing that information to you. Our review team, what I'm recommending, of course, um, we had talked about the superintendent as myself, um, and then Ty Bird, Tyrone Bird, the high school principal. And again, this is after a lot of discussion and kind of just thinking about who would be the best person um, to be able to advise us in, in a, the way that we need. It, 
and bring good information to the school board. And of course, um, the city, uh, Mr. Shields is looking at, uh, he of course would be on the review team as well, at least two of his team, one from economic development and one from planning. So there would, we're thinking it would be right around a team of five. Um, and then of course, um, Tom Horn and Carol McCoskey are there as our advisors uh, as the attorney. So that would complete the team. Mr. Bird was ab absolutely thrilled and excited just with the idea of, of recommending him to the school board. Um, some of you may or may not be aware, but he does have, I think he brings also a unique perspective because he was at Washington Lee when they were going through all of their um, construction. So he has dealt with lots of um, migration of kiddos when uh, the gym was a couple blocks away from the high school and it's pouring rain and you have kids going back and forth and uh, it sounded like it was a, a really difficult actually um, for the kids there. So he brings a, a great perspective having lived through construction as a principal. So I think he would be excellent for us to even evaluate some of those components to give us his, his feedback. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Any uh, questions for Dr. Jones? Mr. Sharp. Well, the full process here is, is rather unclear for me, and I think I began to uh, d discuss at least one aspect of it when we met in, in work session earlier tonight, and that is uh, uh, I think there are, there are some processes that, that need to occur, at least in my mind they, they should occur, uh, that, that parallel and in some cases precede the, uh, this work by a, a team that would uh, actually evaluate the proposals that come in. Um, the, the one that I discussed in work session had to do with financing, and uh, I think that will be an extremely important part of what we're trying to get through here. And, and the earlier that we begin to understand uh, what the parameters are there, the better, as, as Mr. Shields be, uh, gave a, a brief description of them. We, we would need to uh, hear uh, what are the different uh, levels of, of revenue, if you will, that we might expect from different levels of density of the commercial project. Uh, what are the uh, different kinds of uh, financing that we could apply, whether they would be uh, outright purchase or lease, combination of lease and purchase, and then you know, what are the financial instruments that accompany those, uh, including uh, different kinds of bonds, could be a bank loan, could be, could be some other kind of uh, financing arrangement. And, and the sooner we begin to, to grapple with those and understand uh, the, the values involved, the land values, the uh, uh, the commercial values, and also have a chance for the community to communicate to us what their values are, what density they would tolerate at that at that location. Uh, I think the, the 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 better we will be prepared to make a wise choice as to what really will fly uh, and what will be successful uh, on that on that parcel for both school purposes and commercial purposes. And if we wait until, uh, until after the proposals come in and after the small team of uh, staff uh, goes through the process and, and, uh, and then gives us their report, I think that's too late. And so I'll just say, uh, you know, if, 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 that's, if that's the process that's anticipated here, uh, I'm gonna vote no. <laughs> but I hope that we will uh, be looking at uh, some additional ways to get at this besides this small team that's going to make a decision for us at the point, at, only at the point where the proposals have come in, they've had a chance to go over them with, with uh, you know, only the experts that they pick and consult. Uh, I think that's, I think that's not, uh, that's not the process that I would, that I would favor and vote for. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Other comments or questions? Mr. Ankuma. 
Dr. Jones, could you could you refresh our memory again? And, I, and you may have said it again, but if you could just go over it one more time. This approval, re, the review team, that still involves other members of the joint committee, doesn't it? The way that the actual review team, and again, this has been what was recommended by Troutman Sanders, who's guiding us through this process, is that the review team made up of staff from city and school needs to be very small. Part of that is the confidentiality and of the nature and looking at the proposals. Um, the Troutman Sanders would guide us through that process as staff, and what we are doing is basically collating all of this information that we will have from uh, Davenport Financial, from, um, it could be from Arcadia on the high school, um, looking at all of those pieces of collating those and putting them in some sort of structure, again, working with our experts to bring to city council and school board so that you can see here are X amount of proposals. This is the some strengths and weaknesses based on the analysis that these experts have done. And it is ultimately a city school board and city council that actually are the decision makers. It's not this review team is just doing the work because you have real jobs. And we know there's a tremendous amount of work that has to take place during the day. Um, just getting through this process, working with our experts. I think you answered my question with those two words, decision makers. They wouldn't be making the decisions. The decision would still be made by the governing board. Absolutely. The, there's a legal term for it. The, they make recommendations. Yeah, that's and that's fine. why I try to say collating. That, uh, we, we are really collating, um, prioritizing as far as um, perhaps what a, an expert might say. This financial aspect is better in this proposal. They might th say it's better in a different proposal, but maybe the high school is better in proposal A instead of proposal C. So it's bringing all of that information to both governing bodies to make the decision. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Carney. Um, I would say that we've had lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of discussion over quite some time about this particular step in the process. With regard to the school board, um, we've had a community-wide visioning session for the school. We're having another one in this process with staff. We're having another one in this process with the community uh, before this group would ever get together to evaluate proposals. Um, this is an evaluative body and a recommending body, not a decision-making body. And the school board and city council at the end of this work would be not selecting a partner, <laughs> but a short list of partners that we would then give a more detailed RFP to to bring us back more information. So I just want the community to be clear on kind of where we are in the process and what we'll be doing. Um, I don't know what city council has in mind, if anything, to do in terms of general community input on the commercial development part of this process. Maybe Dr. Jones, you can find out and send that back to members of the board. I, I don't know what's happening on, on that side to collect um, community input on that particular part. I know there was a question about design guidelines or not if they're doing community sessions or anything like that, but that would be helpful to know. But that's kind of the process that we find ourselves in um, at this particular moment. Um, I would also like to ask the superintendent to come back as soon as she's aware of it with the list of experts that will be guiding and assisting. I assume that it will be um, our folks that usually do that, but I'd, I'd, I'd want to understand kind of who are the financial advisors and who might be engineering advisors or traffic advisors or construction advisors or, you know, whoever else the other ones are. I'd, I'd like that to be brought back, both for us and for the community so that we understand, you know, kind of who those people are. Hey, Ms. Carney. Other questions or comments? Uh, Dr. Jones, so the, the the entire proposal review team, do you have any idea of how big that's going to be? Right. Um, because it's been recommended to be small, um, Mr. Shields is looking at himself and two other staff right now. But I will be bringing you his list to the school board as well. And he will do the same um, for us to the city council. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? So at this stage, are we at the point where we, we we're requesting additional information? prior to this approval, or do we have to do this right now? Well, let, let me ask the question this way. I mean, this, this, first of all, 
I think, um, as, as was observed, that we're, we're, we're dealing with a funnel here. And we're starting with a very wide funnel, and the funnel is narrowing. And this is part of the winnowing process. Now, ha having said that, there are going to be various, there's like a three-legged stool. You've got your development portion, you've got your financing portion, and you've got your um, educational building portion. We're, we're basically talking about your participation primarily focused on what aspect of this project? For the review team? Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons it's timely is that the proposals will come in on October 30th. And so we, and you only meet so often, and so we need to be sure we know who is that review team because then Troutman Sanders will set the schedule with all of those uh, development folks and it moves pretty fast in the sense that um, we have Thanksgiving and winter break that we're dealing with when we're trying to get to that next step. And so this review team will be ready to go when Troutman Sanders and all of our um, specialists are, are ready. And so, you know, depends if he's able to block off the first two weeks of November, uh, then we may need to be there and prepared to go. And again, it depends on how quickly our experts are working on the project for us. You know, you may have your financial people take three weeks. You may have Arcadis, who's able to do their portion of analysis in two weeks or three and a half weeks. And so that we won't know until we know what we get. Okay, thank you. Mr. Lawrence. So, I mean, to sort of summarize, we're, we're not approving a process here. We're appointing two people into a process that we approved as a body several months ago. And we really need to do it now because we don't meet again until October 13th, right. which is 17 days before the RFPs come in. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. I, I disagree with that interpretation of the uh, motion. And uh, I will say again that there are aspects here, uh, financing being one of them, but I think there are several others that, that uh, we should be preparing to evaluate uh, proposals. And I think there's been too much of a funneling uh, into a very small group of, of, <laughs> of staff, of experts, and not enough of preparation with the community. And uh, <laughs> uh, I, I will just say that, that there, are, there are ways that we should be uh, organizing to try to come up with additional points of evaluation uh, for, for the small review team to use I'm not, not, I'm not arguing that there shouldn't be a small review team to actually review the proposals that come in, but I am saying that we're, we're greatly truncating the process that should, that should occur here uh, by, by not having some additional work done uh, to provide for coming up with, uh, with some uh, ways that the, the small review team will uh, be able to, to reference what the community has said about what it wants in this project. Well, I think, Mr. Sharp, let's, let's uh, tease that out a little bit. The, the, the issue at one level is um, this, we are making a request for proposals. At this stage, um, as has been observed, it's part of a two-stage process where you start conceptually, you down-select to a group, and then you proceed with more detailed designs. I, I think the first step of this, uh, of this small group should be to qualify, if you will, the submissions. In other words, who, who, if, if somebody comes up with a design for a school that, is, that does not meet the criteria, then they're, down, they're, they're not down-selected, they're, they're eliminated. Um, so I, I think, you know, with respect to this filtering process, I, I agree that that level of scrutiny has its, has its place, bless you. But I, I think what we're, what we're really looking at is, again, not who is coming up with something that, it, it's, there are, it's more than a notional concept that will be presented, but it's, it's going to be, you know, it's a, which skeleton can we put flesh on the bones best? And, and so from that standpoint, I think, there is, there is, to say we're looking for something that's in the ballpark is, is probably oversimplifying it, but, but we are looking for something that has the potential to be realized to the point where we say, let's proceed with these, these teams. But I think 
there is, you know, there's a question of how much time and resource can you spend analyzing multiple proposals at that level. And in addition, I think there is the issue that we're constantly struggling with of um, not anchoring ourselves in certain concepts or not preordaining or foreclosing opportunities. And so I think from that standpoint, I, I think you're right. And the question is the timing. And the question is, when is that appropriate? And I think as, as, as we've discussed here at this point, what we're looking to do is to, is to select a promising, uh, not unwieldy, but not too small group that, that will be subject then to the additional design scrutiny. And so my conception of this first stage really is vetting to, to you know, sort out the ones that are non-compliant um, and identify the ones who, who are strongest. And, and I think that the general experience I have had with this process in, in other contexts is that that works pretty well. Um, there are many moving parts here. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's got a level of complexity far greater than, than most of the things that we've seen to date. But, but I would say by the same token, um, because these things are going to be so intricate in their inner workings, the, the three components, um, we will need to um, engage in this in some depth at some time. But if, we're, if, if you want to get to the detailed process, you have to treat the conceptual process in a manner that lets us have the process keep moving. And, and I fear that um, putting too much resource into treating these conce conceptual proposals as detailed ones could come at the ultimate detriment of, of the end product that we seek. Ms. Carney. Um, I do think there's something that could be clarified um, that people maybe are wondering about, and that is so we've We've uh, put this document on the street. We've had a lot of interest in it. We expect at the end of October, we're going to get some number of responses back. We're going to have a, a team that will begin to sift and sort, as you describe, Mr. Castillo, those into people, whether it's a possibility and people where it's not a possibility. But between October 31st and we have a date, which is December 31st, is that right? When the detailed proposal goes out, I think it would be helpful. We don't just have to do it this minute, but it would be very helpful for, for all of us to understand how we get from the conceptual RFP and responses to the detailed proposal, because that's an important step. I mean, that's why we're having a staff kind of visioning session. That's why we're having another community visioning session. That's where our financial advisors will help us. That's where the responses will help us. But I think it would be helpful to understand how we get from the point of all that information to turning around a more detailed RFP and what we th and what that is going to be like, not specifically, but conceptually what it's going to be like, because then people might understand, um, including myself, <laughs> a little bit more about what that would be, um, as well as I think there are questions. Um, so then after that, after that point, there is time where people are going to prepare their proposals and come back to us, and then, and I think when those come back. Um, where there is less confidentiality to them, where more can be shared with the public about them, that that will be the real time and opportunity for the community to say, boy, we told you we thought we wanted this, and now we have these proposals and which ones best match up with what we told you. So I, I just feel like, you know, um, I'm, I'm going to vote for this, and I think this is the right move and the right time in the process, but I do feel like time's going by, and it would be helpful for staff to start to give the community a little bit more, you know, understanding of what is beyond October 31st and how that process kind of goes. Not down to dates and meetings, but just kind of like here are the things that need to be done in that order um, at some time that's relatively soon so people understand that that's understood and can be discussed. Yeah, and I think as, as part of that, you know, standing up the team will be the, the first step in, in getting there. Um, Mr. Sharp, do you, do you have any uh, additional thoughts or comments? Well, I, I will say uh, there's, there's certainly opportunity to get into uh, more of the uh, detail of this once the proposals are in and once the, the team uh, qualifies those who are appropriate bidders, uh, those who are at least in the ballpark of what may be perceived to be acceptable. 
but there is, there is at that point a uh, uh, relatively short time between uh, the time when that small review team will give us that short list and then the point at which we must uh, send some of the people on that short list, perhaps not all of them, but some of them off to do a detailed proposal. I'm, per I'm anticipating that that will be too short a time to really provide for them appropriate guidance on what the detailed proposal is supposed to look like. <laughs> and I think we need to begin sooner to, to get at uh, what it is the community finds acceptable and what it is they, from a financial standpoint certainly, but also from a density standpoint, uh, from, uh, and I think, I think to some extent we've, you know, we, we had the discussion last, last week about, uh, at least I tried, tried to approach it, uh, have, have, we, uh, have we created too rigid a proposal here uh, that, that will not permit us, or permit the proposers to come up with the kind of, of um, flexibility in the building design that, uh, Mr. Chairman, you, you put forward would be desirable. I'm, I'm, I'd still like very much to have a, a, a clarification that yes, they will have that opportunity. Uh, and so, um, that's I, I did check with Dr. Jones on that, and I'm sorry to interrupt. So when I think she could address that that issue. So are, are we in any in, in terms of? The specifications for the educational facilities, is there anything, we, we talked about this for example in the context of the Discovery School um, and is, are there regulations or requirements that basically foreclose uh, various creative options or that, you know, say certain things must be or certain things must not or do we have flexibility no, the, or do the bidders better have flexibility? Yeah, the Virginia guidelines are just guidelines for us as far as um, school design and recommended square footage and in Falls Church, we, not that we don't follow the guidelines, but uh, we, we tend to ask for a product that is better and we've always done that with our schools um, than Virginia guidelines and I really do feel like even in the conceptual, it, it will be interesting to see when the proposals come in. I think we have clearly articulated that we're looking for a 21st century high school uh, you know that allows collaboration and flexibility and um, and I think we'll be able to further refine that and I think the school board uh, has that vision uh, for, for the future just in some of the schools that um, that you've looked at and as you know we, we look at pictures and think about what it could be and I I feel like the, even on the conceptual that we've done that, and we clearly communicated that also at the meeting that we had uh, on the RFP that was held at George Mason, and um, just what we were looking for in a high school. Not looking for boxes for classroom spaces. And that's the easiest way I think to describe it. And truthfully at Mason right now, I mean, you just, you really feel it happening that we're, and I think it's easier for us to communicate it because we're already doing it. We have not waited to have a 21st century building to have 21st century teaching and learning. And I was just mentioning to Dorian uh, before the meeting tonight, how changing that maker studio and, and kind of redefining that space is starting to change how students use the space. And um, like during Mustang block now, I know when my son graduated from Mason, and there really weren't that many kids. He could sit in the same chair every day and didn't have to worry that um, he wasn't going to be able to get that chair at Mustang Block. And now they're out of seats because mm -hmm. it is a flexible space during Mustang Block. There are students that are working. Um, you can see it happening right now inside the old building. So I think we're preparing ourselves for that. We have 200 um, st students in hybrid right now. That's phenomenal. And that doesn't count, you know, another 60 that are doing dual, dual enrollment. Um, all of that is part of 21st century teaching and learning. So I think it's easier for us to think that way because we're doing it. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Uh, all right, might, might we have a motion? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that the school board approve the GMMEH proposal review team comprised of Superintendent Dr. Jones and George Mason High School Principal Ty Bird. Second. Thank you, Ms. Carney, Mr. Lawrence. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Any abstentions? All right, Dr. Jones, uh, I w would say that standing the team up is the first step towards having a process that will, will 
elaborate and you know set out what what the work of this group is going to be and how it's going to do it and what those processes will entail so we look forward to hearing more about that um, now we come to uh, we have a little bit of a, a agenda issue here we don't have uh, no comments we have no superintendent report or board comments so would we have a motion mr. chairman I move that the uh Agenda be amended to add a superintendent's report item 9.01, board and student liaison comments 9.02, and that adjournment be renumbered 10.01. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. All in favor? Oh, do I have a second? Aye. Thank you. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Now we move on to item 9.01, superintendent report. Dr. Jones. Um, tonight, just said school is going well, of course, um, still, you know, clipping along, and it's so fascinating to watch how many students leave or moving right now, and school just started, and how many students are moving in. It's just the inflow and the outflow is fascinating to watch. Um, I will say um, today I had the opportunity to attend the Governor's Roundtable in Manassas, and um, really great news, I think, on that front as far as we hope, where we're moving with the budget in Virginia, he is um, stating that um, this will be an, a, a budget that supports public education. So I'm hoping that that <laughs> will, in fact, um, does happen. And um, it was also nice and, and noted that um, Joan Wadiska, who used to be a previous chair of the school board, is vice chair of the um, State Board of Education. So she was there today. Um, she, she said it was difficult for her because they had a parent forum and the parents were on both sides. And then they had the officials, which she was part of in the front, but she couldn't speak as a parent. So she <laughs> couldn't comment at all um, so it was um, but it was a great meeting today and again everything's going great at school and I think what I said before would be a, even reporting at Mason about the hybrid learning we're really watching how um, those components of our program and dual enrollment which is something the school board set out to do um, the first dual enrollment class that we put in at Mason in 2012 we I think we had nine students so it is something that we're I think we're going to continue to see growing and again those are if we're just expanding what we're offering for any student, what is the right program for you? Is it IB diploma, IB courses, mixed with AP? Is it dual enrollment? Is it hybrid learning? Um, but ex uh, continuing those options. We did um, have our parent nights, and I think the staff have done a tremendous job. We still have Mount Daniel to go. Um, those are in the first part of October. And um, the parent nights, they've, do what? Yeah. Oh, they're other grade level. Yeah, I was just thinking I was there last week. Um, TJ, and, and they've done a great job also of discussing technology at their parent nights. Um, as you know, I think we did a fantastic job at high school last year and had those mandatory sessions for parents. And we realized it was very difficult to get information to parents at elementary and middle about what we were doing last year and what was going on in the classroom. Um, and the principals have done a great job of making sure they're addressing that on that one night they have at elementary and middle when everybody's there and it's parent night. So um, kudos to them really trying to communicate well about what's going on in the buildings. So that's all for me. Uh, Do you want me to and, and how about one more thing? Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, I thought you were going to ask me a question actually. So, um, <laughs> So one of the uh, letters that was on uh, the board agenda tonight had to do uh, with the Apple Watches. And so, um, you know, I had discussed it with the school board and kind of what my frame of thinking was as a school superintendent. Um, you know, I looked at um, the iWatch, and I don't even like that's called a watch because I think it's much more than that, but I looked at it in May, uh, looked at it again, trying to really understand the product and what it could do for our administrative team in June. Um, all of our administrators were in a training together uh, this summer in August and had an opportunity again to see a high-level technician really demonstrate what, what the product actually does. And we weren't really there to look at an, at an iWatch. It just happened to be part of looking at where is technology going in the future. Um, we were asking questions even about our key keyboards going to be around forever. You know, so when we're thinking about high schools and, and <clears throat> 10 and 15 years out, what is the product that will be there? So at that point, um, you know, we realized that it could be a great administrator 
administrative tool for us. Um, however, we, I really wasn't sure that everybody uh, would think that way. And so what I did as a school superintendent is make that available to our administrative instructional team. And when I say instructional team, you're talking about the people that are in the trenches or answering the critical questions on a daily basis. If, they, if that principal needs to reach higher to senior leadership, who do they call? Um, and we made it available as a tool or a resource if they were interested. So we didn't purchase them and just push them out. Um, and we have found that it is an incredibly valuable resource um, for us that we're able to have notifications. We're not missing, I think, some of the notifications we did in the past. Um, and I, I, wanna, I don't know that guys and gals are, are even different, but I know for me, um, a, a lot of times my phone is in my purse or it's on my desk because I don't wear it on me. I don't, I don't wear pants to wear it in my pocket like that. I guess could. Um, but it's made such a difference for me because I can be down the hall, you know, consulting Tom for legal or be in Lisa's office and having a, what we thought was going to be a five minute conversation and not have my phone with me, um, and I'm not missing things. And I think we're all finding that as administrators. And um, I think the thing that I didn't do well was communicate as well, kind of what we were doing, perhaps. Um, that's one of the reasons we put it in morning announcements was to be transparent about it, but um, we did get one or two questions from it. So I think it's just sharing, um, you know, that, that's where we are with it. And we're excited about it as a resource and a tool and think it has value. Um, we're not really sure what the range is in each building. We're figuring that out. You can move around your building. Uh, you can be in other rooms. Um, it will also have our PowerSchool app, which is our student information system. So we can bring up instant, you know, you're trying to find a student in fifth block. Where are they? Uh, they'll be able to do that as well. So um, that's where we are on that right now. Okay, well, well, thank you, Dr. Jones, and, and uh, we'll, we'll move to board comment here. Um, and you're first, Mr. Charpentier, so just get, get yourself prepared. But before we do that, um, a, a, a bit of discussion uh, about this, this issue. I think, um, you know, the first thing with respect to technology, I remember my first daughter was in private school um, when our son began. And when he went into Waterford at Mount, at, uh, Mount Daniel, a computer-based learning uh, reading tool I thought was heresy. Um, and I saw that he learned to read a lot faster than my eldest daughter. So technology works in ways that we don't always understand. Um, and I think uh, we have to have some level of uh, trust in the people whose job it is to teach our kids. And that's not this board. Um, and that touches on another issue about governance. Again, this is an issue where this board exists to supervise the work of the superintendent, who in turn is charged with the education of the children in this division. Um, and, and I was thinking about this in the context today of the uh, Apple Watch, and I was reading about Apple, um, Amazon taking a $170 million write down on their phone offering. And um, it, it, it led me to think also, there's a lot of discussion in this world about failure and how we can learn from failure. I don't view this as a failure. Um, I view this as, a, as an attempt to try to use technology in a way that may ultimately be extraordinarily valuable. We won't know. Um, and, and the board has asked the superintendent uh, to provide updates periodically. I think monthly would be good about what the use cases are for this and how it's working out. Uh, I, I want our superintendent to take chances and I want her to try to use the available technology um, and whatever technology that may be. It may be a blackboard, it may be, um, you know, it may be an Apple Watch, it, who knows. But I, I don't want conservatism to stifle innovation because I think Technology, when appropriately used, can help provide the level of personalized learning that I think is the goal, ultimately, of this system to allow every child to meet their potential. Um, you know, having said that, I, I think we'll, we look forward to hearing about this. And, and if your worst failure this year is that these Apple Watches haven't performed as anticipated, that's a lot better than losing $170 million for Amazon on a, on a failed phone. And, you know, again, for those who say we should try failure and learn from it, um, uh, that means taking chances. It means doing things people haven't done before. Um, playing it safe, I don't think, is, is sound. 
Um, and so the board looks forward to hearing about this, this voyage. Um, and uh, we, we also look forward to hearing about new innovations that you might be considering and, and working with you to make sure that those uh, are rolled out in a, in a way that works well for everyone. Uh, so with that, I will uh, pass it over to uh, board and student comment with you, Mr. Charpentier. Okay, so one thing I'd like to update you on is the student representatives to the advisory committees. The applications for these for the, those students will be due next Friday. Uh, some have already submitted applications and they will be uh, reviewed by myself and the SC teacher who is an SCA sponsor and I am coordinating this with uh, Mr. Lawrence here. And then these will be these students will be recommended to Dr. Jones. So that is the main thing that's going on. And uh, I'd also like to thank you for approving my Model UN trip. I'm looking forward <laughs> to it. You're welcome. All right, uh, shall we start with Ms. Ward on the left here? Sure. Um, I just wanted to add to your comments, Mr. Castillo, about um, the watches. Um, I think in uh, the modern schools, and I see this every day, more and more is being asked of teachers and administrators. Um, they're worn thin, and any kind of technology that could possibly help um, um, uh, uh, school personnel do a better job is a good thing, and we've got to try. We've got to see what's out there. We've got to try and keep abreast of the new um, developments as best as we can. And I think that was a good call on your part, Dr. Jens. Um, I also wanted to bring up uh, this never works me. Um, the, um, a couple of things with um, athletic boosters. I'm going to put a plug in here, <laughs> um, if I can find it. Um, the athletic boosters are auctioning off uh, football tickets and, um, for a fundraiser. And if you give me a chance, I will find it. Um, yeah, it's Redskins. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't find it. I know it's in here somewhere. Let me just try something real quick. Um, let's see in there. Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, the game is Sunday, October 25th at 1 p.m. It's Redskins playing Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, the tickets are priced at $264.30, but will be sold to the highest bidder. So if you're a um, big Redskins or Buccaneers fan, you might be interested in these. Um, they're located in the lower level, row one, seats 12 and 13, about the 20, 25 yard line. So they're good tickets, um, and it's for a good cause, the athletic boosters. Um, so if you are interested, uh, you can contact Kate Nesson or me through the school board, and we'll arrange to get you those tickets. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up that actually this originated from a parent on, um, on the athletic boosters, um, a concern about our school profile. Um, as you know, as uh, Mr. Charpentier can um, agree with uh, seniors are scrambling to apply for colleges right about now and um, that process is, is, has started and um, there has been parental concern about updating the school profile and, and streamlining it um, to um, what college admission counselors look for. Um, I don't know if that's something that uh, I'm not sure who would handle this. That's something that um, um, our communications people. Yeah, I, I think uh, Dr. Jones can. Can I've been in the loop on this. And okay. Yeah. If, if one of you could just speak to, so just no, to Dr. Jones, you can you can speak to that. To assuage uh, the uh, the parents' concerns. Thank you. Right. Um, the high school has looked at um, the high school profile at the request of two different parents, only two. They haven't had a, a larger request, but um, they've done their due diligence to really look at the profile, make sure it's the best that it can be. What I will say is 
it's always difficult to have one document that every parent is going to like. Um, they have been very thoughtful. They've listened to the parent. Uh, Mr. Bird has sent our profile to schools. Um, they said it was an East Coast issue mainly, and actually uh, Mr. Webb also assisted us in this process. We've sent it to schools up and down the East Coast to actually provide feedback on what they thought about the profile, what we should change. Uh, I was in a meeting, um, I want to say maybe yesterday, anyway, it was very recent, uh, just having that West, one uh, last final meeting. There are some things that uh, the high school was asked to do that they do not feel comfortable with changing. Uh, one of those would be that looking at the GPA of the senior class and having that uh, moving throughout the school year, we all feel like that for us as a school division, that's not something that anybody does. Um, you go into the year and what's in the profile is what you have for that senior class. What we don't want to have is a student who applies uh, for an application in October and then somebody else is applying in January and they have two different profiles because you're updating and changing things along the way. So the way the profile is going into the year is the way that it, once we get the data, you have to have your ACT scores, you have to have your SAT scores. Once all that official data is in there, it doesn't change. So that, that part is probably the piece that I would say we, we, we're not going to be able to meet them where they are for our comfort. Uh, we just feel like it would be a lack of integrity um, on how the universities would look at us. But we've worked very hard to listen to their concerns. Um, Amy Krajanowicz has really um, done a lot of work on it. Our um, IB coordinator has been involved and at the table as well, as well as our uh, resource teacher, Allison Johnson, at the high school, so from all frames of reference. And we feel good about where it is. Thank you for um, responding to that. Appreciate it. Mr. Ankuma. Okay. Um, no, nothing yet as the season ramps up on peak on GT and uh, PTSA. However, on the um, chamber, I uh, just want to let this notify folks about uh, two upcoming events. Um, the Network makes out the Creative Cauldron tomorrow. Uh, and all folks are invited. Uh, it'll be down on uh, the, the building. No, no, no. The Maple, on Maple Avenue, Creative Cauldron. Oh, Creative Cauldron, yes. Yeah, so right. Pearson Square. Pearson Square. Yeah. That's what I was looking yeah. for. Thank you. And then the other on the 29th of September is uh, the annual mini, mini golf family fun night, uh, which is held by, uh, I think it's held at the Upton Hill. Regional Park, just along Wilson, off of uh, the 29th, um, uh, at Elder Eden Center, just south of the, is it east of the, east or south of the Eden Center? So, just wanted to point that out. Uh, heading towards Arlington on 29th. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That was uh, that's it. Mr. Lawrence, um, I'll start with uh, Dorian. We had to talk about uh, well bunch of things outside Starbucks a couple weeks ago. Um, the student reps he's talking about were ones that were unfilled as of last year. And one thing he's going to do is make sure that going into every new year, he's got a process in place for student representatives for the school board liaison so that at the end of the school year, people are appointed for when they come in in September. And it's not the new person scrambling to try to get people appointed in September like, like he's doing now. Um, Went to the Education Foundation board meeting. Um, most of this discussion was run for the schools, which I missed because I slept in like three hours later than normal. Um, and I was actually very happy about that. But the foundation decided they're, they're changing their fiscal year to match the school's fiscal year, which, you know, they, they ran into a bunch of problems with things overlapping and they're, they're gonna fix that. We had a very good session at Central Office, I think it was last week, with advisory committee chairs and vice chairs training, uh, mostly done by, by our counsel, Tom Horn. And, and what was really instructive was the questions, because there, were, there was a, a lot of genuine questions about what they were doing and how they were doing it, and was it right? And I think what was the best thing that came out of it was they felt that they had people they can talk to, mostly Tom, when they do have questions about what is a meeting? How do you notice a meeting? What is a subcommittee? When do you need to do X, Y, or Z? So it was, it was very, very positive. Um, other than that, I went to the MEH back to school. And I, I've got to say, the teachers 
almost always made their time this year, which was, it, it's always tough, but it seems like some years they only get through half of their, their talk and then we, we have to move on. But it went, it went very, very well. So, thank you. Ms. Carney. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, just a couple things for me this evening. First, uh, Chairman Castillo, I thank you for your comments about the Apple Watch thing that we find ourselves in the middle of, and I support them. Um, I do also say that the fact that some people are concerned about an expenditure of that size and the community signals that um, we probably have some improvement to do in communication and engagement. I'm pleased that we've added that to our priorities in the school board this year, and I um, would say that we ignored our own risk, not being serious about uh, taking a look at that topic. Um, but I wholeheartedly support your comments, and thank you for them. Um, I would also say that I'm not going to admit, like John, that I overslept and missed the school thing. I'm going to move right along to Parks and Rec, uh, where we met last week for the first meeting of this new year, and I just have a couple things to share with you. One, um, Howard E. Herman Stream Valley Park, you may not know where that is, but if you walk down Broad Street by Panera, you will find it. Um, is a really nice little park in uh, the town. Most people don't know about it. We've just recently completed some renovation work there. I was walking over there on um, Sunday, in fact, before I had a little call with Justin. It's a nice little park. It's a good little walk. Um, but at our meeting on the 9th, we had a public hearing for folks in the community to talk about the master plan for the next stages for that park. And so if you are interested in that, I would encourage you to send your comments. Um, you can get in touch with Danny Schlitt, and he'll give you feedback on what's been done, what we're thinking about doing, and, and uh, take your comments on that. Um, also, West End Park uh, is complete with, except for signage, and if you keep watching your calendar in early October time frame, there should be a grand opening event of some sort so that you can go and take a look at the beautiful um, new park at, at West End. And um, I think that's it for me. Thank you. Mr. Webb. Um, the daycare advisory board met. Um, I was unable to make it yesterday because of, of traffic getting through D.C., which you'll, everyone's probably going to encounter over the next few days because <laughs> of a certain visitor in town. Uh, but uh, from the minutes of that meeting, uh, the uh, director reported that enrollment is slightly down a little bit uh, this year from this time last year. Also reported, uh, which we also uh, discussed, about the hiring of the new, uh, of a new office assistant and some uh, for the next meeting there will be some discussion of bylaws and that we they elected a uh, chair who was a continuation of a chair uh, for the upcoming year for the advisory group uh, and then my uh, comments in relations to the um, the iWatch uh, for me uh, I guess I take a slightly different position that I am not supportive of that purchase uh, it's not necessarily the amount um, that it was but it is the uh, some of the rationale that was were given uh, for that purchase uh, of the iWatches um, I am as supportive of anyone of bringing technology into the classroom and enhancing uh, the learning experience for our students but with this particular purchase, I do not necessarily see the functionality of the purchase. It was, I don't think it was necessary um, purchase, um, but they are here now. They, um, but they're here. Um, looking forward to the, to the updates of how they are being implemented and used. Um, but I think that that five thousand dollar, granted, it is not a large sum of money, but I think that could have been used for other purchases within that same realm, technology realm and not necessarily with the purchase of, of iWatches for, for the administrators. Um, but we, again, what's done is done is it's a learning experience because of, of some of the feedback that we've gotten from the community. And again, learning experience for the communications part of it to to be able to communicate and put this information out with uh, our our constituents in a, a much better and more effective way uh, for these type purchases because we have had continual communications with uh, folks who ask questions about our, our technology purchases and I think this falls into the realm of one that um, give, gives me pause of, of the purchase. 
Thank you. Hey, Mr. Webb, Mr. Sharp. Yeah, I think uh, as I try to continue, continue a little bit on that same topic so it doesn't get, doesn't get lost here, um, I'll just say I, I was pleased to hear more of an explanation of the process that uh, Dr. Jones went through in, uh, in making the purchase uh, that she was initially uh, uh, not uh, really enamored of the, of the, uh, the device itself. Uh, had to be uh, uh, shown different ways that it could work and different uh, functions that it could help with. And uh, even once she uh, became uh, convinced that it could help her in her own duties, uh, she then offered it to staff, people, and was not uh, requiring them to take it, but uh, was only uh, 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 making a distribution of the devices to those who also felt that it would add to the to the value of of what they brought to the to their administrative duties and so uh, in that that process to me was a much much better process than I initially understood uh, as far as as being able to get at uh, this as as a more thorough budgeting process I'll, I'll just blame myself there um, this, if, if there are these things that, that uh, could be uh, the subject of um, public scrutiny that uh, uh, put uh, potentially uh, not so favorable light on, on a purchase, uh, th those are things that, uh, uh, in my way of thinking, I should have been very careful to make sure that that, that uh, was able to be anticipated within the budget process that we went through in the spring. And if I didn't bring it out at that point, uh, shame on me. Uh, so uh, those, those are things that, uh, you know, I don't think we can go to a zero base budgeting system, but we ought to be as detailed uh, as we need to be to make sure that our public will support uh, those expenditures, purchases that we, that we come up with. Uh, and if we don't, uh, it's 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 our fault, and then in this, in this case, uh, to the extent there's uh, appropriate uh, public concern about it, it's uh, I'll, I'll take the blame for it. Uh, I did also uh, get some contact uh, in the recent days from a uh, person who's uh, 1960s alum of George Mason High School, and uh, is interested in developing uh, better system for uh, having the alumni come in uh, on their reunion uh, weekends and be able to tour the, uh, the school and learn what the prospects are for coming up with a new school uh, and other things about uh, what's happening in, in, uh, in their alma mater. And I look forward to uh, helping with uh, getting that tour that he requested it off on October the 3rd, so anyone who's uh, an alum who's interested in that kind of tour, uh, that there, is being, there is one being organized for the morning of October 3rd. Uh, you can get to me if you, if you want to there. There are others uh, that I know are going to be in the area uh, later this month, and I think uh, there will be some additional tours requested, and I'll do what I can to facilitate there. And I want to thank Dr. Jones for responding very quickly uh, to the uh, uh, request that I had made and, and assured uh, that uh, uh, there would be uh, people who would be uh, on site and uh, knowledgeable and available to help conduct these tours uh, and that they would be, they make every attempt to make them convenient for the alums. Mm -hmm. I also had contact from a former board chair uh, named Patrick Rickards <laughs> and uh, he is currently a director of the Woodrow Wilson Fellowship Foundation uh, which is associated with, I believe, Princeton University. In any case, uh, uh, he directs a fellowship program that uh, will provide several million dollars per year uh, to state colleges, and already five states are participating in this. It's teaching fellowships in math and science, and Dr. Jones, again, was very cooperative in uh, helping to deliver a letter of support for uh, bringing this kind of teaching fellowship to Virginia colleges uh, through Patrick's foundation. 
and uh, she delivered that letter to uh, one of the governor's aides this morning in, in uh, the meeting that uh, she talked about earlier that was held in Manassas. So uh, uh, I'm hopeful that uh, we may see some, some good results there. Uh, I would like to, uh, I don't need the answers tonight, but I would like to understand uh, for some time in the near future uh, when we may receive a report uh, about the pride survey that was done in the spring and apparently was still being uh, assessed up, up until a few weeks ago. Uh, that's a survey of uh, student behavior, uh, drugs and alcohol and that kind of thing. But uh, uh, also, I think it, it also looks into the support systems that students uh, have of one kind or another. So we, we have an idea of what services are, are being uh, accessed and, and what may be needed. Uh, also, the health committee that we adopted under 5.12, I'd like to understand how that committee uh, is going to be constituted and, and uh, look forward to, to bringing that about. I did meet with the BIE council. Uh, Mary Beth Connolly is the staff representative to there. She's always really on, on top of things and getting uh, just more and more and more and more contacts with business partners in the community. She did a Again, an outstanding job of getting those uh, people to support uh, the people, the, the uh, new staff members who are coming into our schools, making them feel welcome and, and giving them supplies and free lunches and, and just the, uh, the warmth of a, uh, a very strong community that supports its schools. Eric Pelton is the new chair of that council, uh, taking the baton from Tori McKinney, who did a, an outstanding job uh, leading that group uh, over the past couple of years. The run for the schools was great fun, and I want to thank uh, Debbie Hiscott and all those uh, with the foundation who helped to put that together. Uh, the cross-country team who helped to monitor the different uh, spaces where people had to make their turns and uh, keep, keep the uh, local traffic from creeping in. And of course, our police department who also assisted with uh, uh, great help there. Uh, finally, uh, uh, this coming Thursday, the Fairfax Partnership for Youth will hold a mentor training uh, opportunity at the Panino building. That's one of the government center buildings in Fairfax, 7 to 9 p.m., and that's Thursday night. The mentors will primarily be recruited to serve the Home Stretch program. That's a, a program that serves homeless families in our area, but they'll also be eligible to serve as youth mentors in other youth service programs in our area. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Uh, at the risk of piling on, the race for the schools was uh, something that I continue to think about every day of this week um, because I don't run. I stopped running. I ran and, and I, uh, you don't happen to know that Park Avenue heading up from the bike path towards the library is called Heartbreak Hill, but, <laughs> but it is because I got a cramp that I'm still living with. But anyway, uh, thanks to everybody involved, uh, also Troop 895 for providing uh, refreshments but not any uh, pain relievers, um, and uh, Debbie Hiscott, Cecily Shea, uh, Coach Braven was out there running much faster than everybody else. I have to say, Kieran was looking excellent. Um, he, he, when I'm 55 the way he is now, I hope to look that good. Um, you know, I, I was reading a biography recently, was a history of uh, World War II and uh, FTR and uh, his leaders, including George Marshall, and one of the things FDR told George Marshall at one point was, you know, I may tell you what to do, and I may tell you when to do it, but I won't tell you how to do it. And, you know, with respect to the Apple Watch, uh, just a coda here, I, uh, again, we, as a governing body, um, charged the superintendent with doing her job of educating the kids, keeping them safe. Um, she made this decision, and we will see how it plays out in, in practice, but, but I think we need to bear in mind the role of the school board is not to sit over people's shoulders and say, I think uh, you, know, you really should get a two gigabyte um, Mac Air instead of the one. You know, we have to let people do their jobs. 
and we have to trust people that they will do their jobs well. And when they need some assistance with that when there are issues, we will certainly raise that, but, but we are not in the business of hovering over the people who educate our kids. Um, and do we want people in this school division to um, be so conservative, as I mentioned before, that, that really nothing gets done and nothing gets innovated? And I would say no. Um, last night was at George Mason for uh, kind of what's going to happen to your senior kid for the next few months, and that was very well attended. Uh, it's going to be on uh, TV recorded, so anybody with seniors who wants to know what the future has in store, I would advise you to take a look at that. Um, I, I came across a statistic that I can't help but uh, publicizing. Um, the graduation rate nationally for high school is 81 percent. Um, for Harvard, it's 98 percent, and for George Mason, last year it was 100 percent. So I, I thought that was a, a useful data point. Yale was somewhat below Harvard, unfortunately, like 96.8 <laughs> percent. Um, let's see, what else? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's his fault. Uh, and, and I think that pretty much sums it up. So we miss. Oh, oh, wait. Oh, I'm sorry. Before I forget, um, I, I did want to note that Mr. Horn is meeting with all the alumni from George Mason on Friday at 530, 50th anniversary class, and he's buying the drinks. No. <laughs> 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 okay, uh, Mr. Webb. Just real quick, back to what Margaret was discussing earlier about the uh, the transcripts and what you put in the uh, the profile. Um, at some point last year, that I met with uh, with Miss Kajanowitz, uh, Mr. Bird, and Miss jo Dr. Jones about that, and just giving my more so professional um, experience of that, uh, and, and generally what. The discussion of what should be in there I gave the opinion of. I think the overall profile was pretty good of what they have in there, and the discussion about what she was just talking about of taking out. I would not be as a an admissions professional. I would not be supportive of changing the profile from one semester to the next because a group of students' grades have increased because that gives a, a kind of a different perspective of that everyone at least at the beginning of that semester that year starts off on equal footing and if their GPA goes up it goes up if it stays the same it stays the same but it does not give uh, it gives I think a, a level playing field for all the students who are applying to colleges and universities so um, I think it's always good to to look at and review those things but I think um, which they've done and I think they've done a, a good job of reaching out to multiple sources um, for feedback about the profile. Thank you, Mr. Webb. That's a useful perspective from somebody who is in the admissions business, so thank you. Uh, well, we could tarry or we could adjourn. What do you say? Let's adjourn. adjourn. Thanks. <laughs>